Hello everyone, my name is Pierre Cook. I am the Leader of Government Business of the Barbados National Youth Parliament. I am the Youth Technical Advisor to the Healthy Caribbean Coalition. I am a Youth Advocate as well for the Barbados Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition. Um, I've been in these organizations for about four years and we have been working especially within the health groups with the Healthy Caribbean Coalition and the Barbados Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition to raise awareness on the prevention and control of non-communicable diseases, particularly childhood obesity. Um, in our Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition, we have just about 20 members and it includes young persons who are passionate about sharing messages on why children should be exposed to better health circumstances, why they shouldn't be exposed to predatory advertising. And we want to share these messages with the entire um, of our community, as well as the wider Caribbean. Um, the Healthy Caribbean Coalition provides me with a platform to reach out to young persons across the region to share these messages and help them to build their capacity to be better health advocates. I was introduced to the issue of um, childhood obesity in Barbados particularly, I think in 2017, after attending a civil society stakeholder meeting held by the Healthy Caribbean Coalition. Now, what was interesting to me are, were the staggering statistics of one in three Caribbean children being overweight or obese. And I was thinking about my experience in high school and about how many students were exposed to sugar-sweetened beverages and healthy foods. And for me, I felt like this was an issue that needed to be addressed not only by the adults in the room, but by young persons. Um, it became a passion for me because after going to that meeting and learning about the issues and going out into the community with the organizations and sharing the messages, I began to learn just how much childhood obesity was um, affecting young persons within our societies. So I saw children at school who didn't have access to drinking water for a long period. So they were either in classrooms and their parents sent them juices. I saw more and more, I recognized more and more that young persons were a bit on the heavier side. And I always wondered what was the reason or whose fault was it? Who was to blame? Now, initially, I just thought, you know, children should eat healthier. Children should make healthier options. But I've now grown to a space where I understand that it's an onus on society as well as the, as the government to put systems in place to protect our children. For me, I want young persons to understand what their role is in helping to prevent the um, prevalence of NCDs. And I think it's providing them with the information, providing them with the tools to understand how it affects their health and helping them to be better advocates which is why we developed the Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition and the Healthy Caribbean Coalition as well as working on a regional group called Healthy Caribbean Youth. And in that group, we're hoping to raise more conversation across the region, not only in Barbados, about the prevention of childhood obesity and other NCDs. So interestingly, how I was exposed to it was at that same meeting. And I remember going to a follow up meeting at a different location. And there was a question about, or from the youth in the room, what did we think are the policies that should be put in place to help children? What did we think was best? What policies would we put into our schools? And I think they were trying to gauge or get a sense from us what we thought was best for our health or what we understood to be comprehensive policies. Interestingly enough, I was the spokesperson for my subgroup. And in going up to speak on behalf of the subgroup, I think I got a bit passionate about it and spoke um, for a long while about just how I saw uh, the environment affecting our health and just how I saw childhood obesity fitting into our structure and our environment. Um, and why I thought it was necessary for systems to be put in place, not only by the society, but by governments and by parents and other stakeholders to protect the health of children. Um, so I'm a second year law student at the University of the West Indies, Cavill campus. And I understand now more than ever that children have access to certain rights and inalienable rights. And it means that government has a responsibility to ensure, since they've signed on and ratified the Convention of the Rights of the Child, to ensure that children have access to the highest attainable standard of health. That means that we need comprehensive policies put in place to protect our children, whether it's the prevention of front of package, sorry, the prevention of predatory marketing within schools, um, whether it is that we don't want children exposed to predatory marketing on the television, um, whether it's we're asking for front of package labeling, increased taxes on sugar sweetened beverages, all of these help to protect our children or create healthier environments for our children to be protected and have access to the highest attainable standard of health. One of the things I like to say or share in the beginning of any presentation that I make or any speech that I give or maybe even at the end, but it has to get out there. There should be nothing for the youth without the youth. 
what that means is that youth and young people should be given the opportunity to speak up um, for issues affecting them, whether it's in health, whether it's in getting jobs. Young persons should be able to bring their own perspectives to the table on behalf of their peers. Um, I have been fortunate through the Healthy Caribbean Coalition um, to represent Barbados and the Caribbean across the world for various um, enterprises. And when the conversation comes up about young people and their rights and what they need, there is a difference between when that message is brought by a young person and when it's brought by an older person. You find that young people are able to speak um, with a bit more passion and you can relate more to that message as a young person when you hear it coming from another young person. Um, older persons tend to be a bit more, I guess, disengaged or further removed from the current experiences of young people. Um, and it's not to say they can't be advocates, but I find that a young person is better able to bring that message and paint a more realistic picture of what is happening on the ground. Um, so it's very important for us to own the spaces and youth leadership has to be a part or go hand in hand with youth, youth advocacy. Um, what that means for me is that in my ventures to raise awareness and share these messages with, with young persons is that they're given the capacity building tools, whether it's how to devel develop an elevator's pitch, um, whether it's necessarily how to formulate a policy um, or advocacy campaign, um, providing them with the necessary tools so that they can then go on in their communities and their countries and be better advocates for the health of young people. Um, so in helping young persons to own the spaces, you need to provide them with the capacity building tools so they then can carry the message and share with other young persons and teach them how to become better advocates as well. So young persons have been invited to the table. In some instances, we've created our own table and we're having these conversations about the health of young people. What is needed to ensure that in a couple of years, our children or even ourselves, we have a better health system. Um, how we engage young persons is, again, by providing them with opportunities to build their capacity, build their skills, so whether it's um, how to do online advocacy, how to share messages to your local um, parliamentarian or representative, um, how to communicate the message effectively. Um, these types of tools and skills help young persons to be more confident in being able to deliver messages on behalf of their peers. Um, how this has affected or changed the landscape in terms of health conversation is that more and more you find um, articles in a paper from young people or you find young persons speaking on political platforms uh, on behalf of youth. Um, it might not be particularly within health specifically, but in other, um, other areas as well. So uh, we have within our Childhood Obesity Prevention Coalition several passionate young persons who are able on the flip of a hat to say, you know what, I'm going to speak on this issue of childhood obesity. Within the Healthy Caribbean Youth Organization, we have some young persons who are able to speak on issues relating to young people in cancer, for example, or mental health issues. And we find that when you train and you develop these advocates, they are more confident in speaking up. And that is what we need, more young persons speaking up and speaking out for the interests of their peers. So within this uh, movement and within the conversation that we've been leading in the Caribbean, um, particularly with childhood obesity, there have been some uh, lessons that we've learned about advocacy and how young persons should share their messages. And one of the major issues that you would hear youth talking about time and time again is tokenism. Um, tokenism necessarily means where you sometimes are invited into the room or you're invited into the space as a symbol. Um, not necessarily for any real input or contribution to the conversation, but just to say, you know what, we involved or engage young persons in the conversation. That has been one of the major challenges, not only in the Caribbean, but from my colleagues I've heard across the world, um, it's been an issue. What we've realized is that we need to stand up and demand access to these spaces, which have traditionally left young persons out of the conversation. We are demanding to be let into rooms where the ministry are, are having conversations about policies for schools. We are demanding to be let into conversations, even in political spaces, about what young persons need to protect and give them better access to health. Um, and then we find that where we're not having access to these rooms or we're not being invited, we will create our own tables. So my message is to you, um, if you don't have access or if you're finding it very, very difficult to reach the persons you need to reach, create your own table. If you're begging for a seat at a table and you're not having access to that seat, create your own table and amplify the voices of your peers. And I'm sure that it will reach the doorsteps of whoever you need it to reach in order to get that change effected for the health of young persons in your community and across your country. Hi, I'm Ben, a chef and one of the co-founders at Sorted Food. 
in a nutshell. It's based on the friendship of four old school friends from about 22 years ago, but that's expanded into about 16 digital natives operating from a studio in East London. Well, you know, when we're all hanging out, Zooming, slacking or Skyping from home. But more importantly, Sorted Food is about the people we engage with. It's one of the world's leading food and cooking conversations with an online community of well over 3 million foodies spanning the planet. Crucially, this digital generation feel a part of our sorted community and have a real diversity of cultural food opinions, insights and understanding. Our job at the beating heart of that ever-evolving real-time conversation is to conduct, curate and then retell the stories or nuggets that we learn in order to share and publish out to the wider world. Yet none of this is done with the intention of preaching or even really teaching. We're all on this journey together, no us and them, just peer-to-peer -peer discussions on the topics around food that are important to all of us. That could be nutrition, the provenance of where our food comes from, the packaging it's wrapped in, the importance of gut health, the necessity for responsible and sustainable practices to best look after our own bodies, the people and communities who produce our food, and of course the planet itself. As you might imagine, these are not light-hearted conversations, but we never take things too seriously. We believe these conversations should first and foremost be entertaining. They're to lift spirits in what can otherwise very quickly become a future of doom and gloom. We aim to inspire and share the positive outcomes that we can all change and implement around us. And then by leading with that entertaining and inspiring content, we hope that it'll accidentally educate. But it's all for free on platforms where a younger generation feel naturally comfortable, are keen to speak out and share their thoughts. By doing so, they're able to steer and shape not just the conversations we have this year and next, but the whole future of our food systems. At Sorted, we live and breathe food in order to empower young people with passion, knowledge, skills, and the tools so they can confidently cook with whatever they have available. We don't believe it's for us to dictate what's right and wrong in the food world, but what we can do is open the conversation. Sorted scale and influence allows us to gain access that perhaps Joe Public can't. We can ask experts the questions on behalf of our audience and then share the trusted facts and reality to let people make up their own minds. It's fair to say that right now we're all consuming more food than ever before, not just calories into our mouths, but via food content too. Netflix food shows winning awards, live TV cookery remaining the bedrock of weekend morning television in the UK, and competitive cooking shows bringing in record viewing figures. In the case of YouTube, in a single month, well over 10 million people will voluntarily choose to watch over 2 million hours of sorted food content. And this content has the ability to shape and change behaviours around food, but only if we understand our food and where it comes from. What has been evident recently is just how quickly trust can be lost in politics, in large multinational corporations, even in science. The youth of today are connected to a wealth of information. The challenge, of course, is which of this can be trusted and what is simply fake news. All too often, we'd rather listen and accept the opinions of our mates after a drink or two at the pub than to accept what's being published by the experts. Social media has harboured a generation of armchair experts, but this can be a great thing. More young people showing more interest in politics, agricultural bills, the trade conversations than ever before. But there's still a lot to be done to help these two very contrasting worlds marry up. Content creators with positive sentiment and the potential for social influence already have a community of people keen to listen, ask questions and engage. And they exist across most niches, farming, nutrition, chefs, skilled artisanal crafts like butchery or cheese making. And it's the youth audiences that they engage with that have the most power moving forward. We believe it would be really exciting if in the future, those spending the huge resources to fund the proper research to provide trusted data and understanding around nutrition, agriculture, food supply, food systems and policies, also consider the best way to share the results. Stuffy PowerPoint slides, black and white reports heavy enough to wedge open a fire door and industry-focused summits, they might not be the answer, or at least only part of the solution. For real change, you need to harness the youth of our nations in the places where they instinctively reside, and to do that, entertain and inspire first, peer-to-peer. -peer. Make it relevant and aim to be sat at the pub table with us, not talking down to us. It will take time, years, 
of organic and authentic relationship building. Can't really be fabricated or rushed, but it is worth it. Alternatively, of course, consider leapfrogging the timeline and harnessing the power and opinions of youth audiences today by partnering with those that have spent the last decade earning that trust. What we do know is that whilst the last year or so has seen populations all over the world having to push pause on life, food and the systems that keep it all moving have continued. If anything, people have been pushing the play button on the role of food within our lives in this new normal more than ever. The digital space is the place to explore, learn and understand more about our food. And it also just so happens to be the place that millennials and Generation Z thrive. If you want to harness the power of youth to transform food systems, it's online communities that can supercharge that. My name is Tasha mcquire Cora, and I'm a Youth Board Co-Chair at Fight Back 2030. Fight Back is a non-profit organisation that works to improve the health and well-being of young people. Our aim is to reveal the truth about how the food system is designed and explore ways we can redesign it to put young people's health at the forefront of its operations. We hope to build a powerful alliance with governments, businesses, schools, parents, guardians, other young people and everyone else who can help make that redesign a reality. And at the heart of Fight Back is the Youth Board. We're a group of teenage activists from across the country who are dedicated to campaigning for more and fairer opportunities to be healthy. We believe that all young people should have the opportunity to thrive and be healthy no matter where they live and Fight Back exists to make sure this happens. We are up against a flood of unhealthy foods pouring out from our high streets, supermarket shelves and school canteens and as a result 3.3 million children are overweight and the UK has the worst obesity rates in Western Europe. And so why do I personally care about this issue? One of the reasons I joined Backpack was because I wanted to change the narrative when we discussed the issue of child obesity or obesity in general. Often the debate focuses on the role of the individual. If it's children, it's parents' fault. If it's adults, well, it's their fault because ultimately they're in control of what they put in their mouth. And the conversation emphasis, emphasizes this idea of choice and fails to acknowledge that the environment in which people live in has considerably changed. Gone are the days where healthy and nutritious food are easily accessible, where young people have access to open spaces and community clubs as places to socialize. I remember growing up in my high street was plagued with fast food shops and opportunities to get food that was not only healthy but also affordable were very limited. And a lot of young people have similar experiences because our food environment is still very obesogenic. It doesn't encourage healthy eating and healthy living. So how did I get involved? Well, to keep it short and simple, a couple of years ago, I sourced work experience with the Director of Public Health Lewisham, Dr. Danny Rita. And this was at the time that the government had published the 2016 Childhood Obesity Report and had also announced plans to introduce the sugar tax to the soft drinks industry. And Dr. Rita said something that really resonated with me. He said, it's not that people have become lazier or greedier since the 1980s, early 90s. Instead, the environment in which people live in has dramatically changed. From then on, I started to observe my food environment and I came across so many health inequalities that went on to fuel my activism. Why is youth leadership so important? For me, youth leadership plays an important role in the development of our communities and the rest of society. Young people have an important contribution to make in decisions that impact our lives. It means we have the opportunity to have our opinions considered and our views taken into account in matters that affect us the most. So when we're discussing the topic of childhood obesity, youth engagement, youth leadership is important because decision making processes need to reflect the lived experiences of young people as to better inform the outcomes of these decisions. In other words, childhood obesity strategies, plans, they all need to be child initiated and child centric. How do we engage young people then? For me, it's through meaningful engagement. This is the kind of engagement that is inclusive, it's intentional, it is a mutually respectful partnership between young people and adults. It's not just a tick box exercise. In this engagement, power is shared, respective contributions are valued, and young people's ideas, perspectives, skills, strengths, weaknesses are integrated in the design and delivery of any initiative.
So one of the challenges that I think young people face when it comes to engagement is it is often assumed that the more experience, it is always better. In addition, certain types of experiences like attending a certain school or working in a particular profession, all of these tend to be valued more than others. These values and assumptions privilege only certain types of experiences and they do not leave room for young people. We need to recognise that young people do have valuable skills and knowledge and we need to make room for different kinds and levels of experiences. My advice on how we engage more youth in food system change. For me, as a young person, I can relate to the idea of it being intimidating to speak to a group of adults, especially since young people are often outnumbered in meetings and events, conferences, etc. So once we are at the table, it's important to create an environment of respect that allows our, our voices and our opinions to be heard. A possible solution could be including practicing active listening. There's nothing more annoying for a young person to be so vocal about our opinions, about what we're so passionate about, for only only for it to go through one ear and come out through the other. So we need to cultivate an environment that values what young people have to say and ultimately make sure that these voices are reflected in the actions that we take out of these meetings. So thank you so much for listening to me and I look forward to the discussions that we're going to have. Hello, my name is Amanda Namai. I come from Kenya and I am based in Nairobi. I am an advocate for youth involvement in agriculture. Such a fancy term that simply means I'm pro youth in agriculture, simply put. And that means, or rather that has seen me take up a number of roles, um, one of them being um, Go Getters Lead at the Alliance for a Green Revolution in Africa, Popularly known by the acronym AGRA, I am also a contributor for the COVID-19 Food Future Initiative by the TMG Think Tank. And finally, I am a board member for the Youth Alliance for Zero Hunger, which is global. So what do these various, various, various things do? So let me start right off the bat by talking about the Go-Getters, which has three components to it. So the first is a campaign that focuses on positive messaging on agriculture. And the second is the prize, where we have a competition for youth in agriculture to participate. And there are cash prizes of 50,000 US dollars for the top two contenders. And we also have another category of winners called Impact Award winners. And then the third component of Go Getters is the Go Getters community. Now, this is a virtual platform that brings together all stakeholders in the agricultural value chain mentors, investors, the youth agripreneurs themselves, and prospective youth in agriculture. So that's um, a collaborative platform that brings everyone together. And then I'll talk slightly about the COVID-19 Food Future Initiative that um, looks at the effects of the pandemic on Africa's food system. And then finally is the Global Alliance for Youth for Zero Hunger, which seeks to have youth voices at policy level. So the Youth Alliance for Zero Hunger works closely with the Rome-based agencies, also another acronym, RBAs, um, and also for youth participation at the Committee of World Food Security, CFS. And the reason why I feel and I'm really passionate about having young people involved is that um, in Africa, where I come from, we have the largest um, statistic for youth. We have the largest youth population in the world. And coupled by the fact that also Africa has the most arable land, 60% of Africa's land is arable, meaning we can grow food on it. And it is important to have the youth involved because again, looking at the statistics, the age of the average farmer is above 50 years old. And we keep singing and chanting and saying that youth are the future of this world, but we need to begin now. We have no future to look forward to. We create our own future. So for the young people involved in agriculture, it is really important to have 
first their voices represented at policy level we don't want to be discussed by other people we want to table our own issues for discussion and that can help frame uh, policies and and help um, do the policy guidelines to address issues that directly challenge uh, challenge the youth or are affecting the youth and then secondly it's important for youth to understand that agriculture goes beyond just production we are looking at a food system we're looking at value chains how everything links up together and it's also really exciting because right now the youth have a plethora of skills that they can bring to the agriculture sector those who are really good at engineering those are really good at IT those are really good in finance those are really good at insurance these are all skills that can come together to bolster the agriculture sector and in order for the food systems to be a success in order for us to achieve the SDGs on zero hunger and other supporting SDGs like climate action it is important for agriculture to interlocute with the other sectors like I mentioned energy um, finance mechanization it is really important because agriculture cannot grow on its own it's about time that we deconstruct the silos and also broaden our perspective on agriculture that we shouldn't see it as just one pillar on production there are other value chain players who come who come who come into the picture so I'm really excited for this to to have more young people engaged and have the positive messaging on agriculture that agriculture is not a last resort it's not a poor man's job it's not only constricted to production and in whichever way or form that you feel that you can contribute to the sector please as a young person do not hold back be it your skill in communication be it your skill in it whatever it is agriculture needs it and we have to look at it wholesomely and not in piecemeal so i'm really happy to be a part of this uh, discussion and i hope to to gain positive insights and also inculcate in what i do and help also help me work better and achieve better results so thank you and that's my brief cameo for this edition hi there my name is emily bobo don Baxtadola. It's a pleasure to be here today speaking at this symposium. I graduated in industrial development and I hold of a master's in social anthropology and I'm currently the student director at G4 Nature, a global youth-led organization which aims to empower, educate and mobilize young people to lead and advocate for solutions to the climate and ecological crisis which are rooted in nature, which are rooted in science, which are rooted in justice and which are rooted in traditional indigenous local and community health knowledge and practices. Youth for Nature has three main pillars, including knowledge sharing, capacity building, and storytelling, storytelling which is the one which I lead on. Under all these pillars, Youth for Nature carries out different types of activities, from webinars to getting underground delegations at key international events to running a storytelling campaign trying to ask young people to submit their stories so we can amplify and elevate their voices on climate and um, environmental change issues. The all this work, which is by youth and for youth, is supported by a team of over 50 members, including both staff and volunteers. Aside from Youth for Nature, I'm also part of other climate youth-led networks and organizations through which I try to push for climate justice and environmental justice, both at a national in the UK at an international level. Normally, within my climate work, I tend to focus on some key particular issues, including issues around adaptation and resilience when it comes to climate change impacts and environmental degradation, uh, as well as issues around just transition and social justice, particularly adopting an intersectional and inclusive lens which tries to leave no one behind. I also focus, particularly the Youth for Nature, on issues around ecosystems, including conservation, restoration, and rehabilitation. And last but not least, and most importantly for the topic of this event, I really, really work and I'm really, really passionate about issues around how we can transform our food systems, particularly looking at the impacts of climate change, but also about how food, our current food systems have an impact and contribute to climate change. And also particularly, I like to focus on agricultural issues within this big area of work. 
My journey into the climate and environmental movement really began through my education, from my school, through college, and through my university studies. During these times, I always was very curious and interested in on environmental issues within biology curriculum. And then in university, I decided to specialize and pick models particularly related to climate change and environmental issues and challenges and ways to address them. However, it wasn't until two, three years ago when I realized of the really important for me to be more proactive and to really engage on this work from an advocacy and a service delivery perspective. This was because during a visit uh, and a time I spent doing some research in San Luis and Dar in Senegal, I realized that the impacts of climate change and environmental degradation are already being felt by many communities across the whole world, and that action and advocacy cannot wait. Upon my return here to the UK, I decided to begin, to begin volunteering for different organizations working on climate and environmental issues, including both organizations at a local level here in my community in Brighton, as well as at a national and international level through different youth-led organizations and networks mobilizing for climate justice. Through all this work in the last two, three years, I found my place in the end in Youth for Nature, and eventually into my current role as a student director. This journey has been really exciting and really thrilling, and I hope that it continues in the years to come. In particular, one of the highlights of working on this space is that I get to work and collaborate with other young people who have the same energy, passion and drive to address the climate and environmental crisis as I do. It's always very energizing to be in a space with people who have like us like similar visions, similar energy, and who really, really want to push for more radical and ambitious action, as we realize that environmental action cannot wait. Not only because our future as young people is at stake, but because in various of our communities and for various people from like different disenfranchised and disadvantaged backgrounds, the impacts of environmental and climate change are already being felt, or felt often quite unfairly. The difficult relationship between climate change, environmental degradation and biodiversity loss on the one hand, and agri-food systems, well, food systems in general on the other, often paralyzes action uh, in this sphere when it comes to key institutions and governments, both nationally and internationally. Here, young people can play, well, young people play a vital role in keeping conversations moving forward and in pushing decision makers and policy makers to take bold action. However, young people's role in food system transformations in light of climate change and related issues doesn't end in advocacy. Something which I really love about my job in Youth for Nature is getting to hear about and learn about the stories of young people leading by example in their own communities to their own projects that address climate and environmental challenges. From composting initiatives to improve recycling and waste management in urban areas, through uh, establishing permaculture and agroecological um, work on the ground in rural communities and villages. Young people are currently across the world leading different initiatives and working on the ground on different issues in order to push our food systems to be more sustainable and more climate resilient. And this work is often not recognized or not seen or not supported. Within established institutions and organizations, as well as policy-making cir circles, there is often this perception that young people are not interested in food issues, particularly when it comes to the agri-food system and agriculture. This is because there are trends that point out that young people are living in mass numbers, rural communities and agricultural communities for better job opportunities in urban centers and overseas countries. While this trend cannot be denied or ignored, Focusing on the problem so much and not the causes leads people to make the wrong assumption that young people in some way need to be motivated to engage in agriculture. It's not a matter of motivation, but it's a matter of having the capacity and having good conditions for working in this sphere, which are often absent. Indeed, the agri-food system and the food system in general is often populated by a lot of precarious jobs and types of employment, as well as a lot of subsistence labor and unfree or unpaid labor. That's why my last message that I want to say is that if you're looking to engage young people in food issues and in food system issues in light of climate change, you shouldn't ask, how can I do it? The question should be first, looking at what young people are leading on the ground already, the different initiatives and the different work, and how you can support it, amplify it, or provide resources to, resources to scale it up. Second, as well, it's important that when you want to get young people involved in your own initiatives, you must pay attention to their needs and to their desires, 
open up opportunities for collaboration and co-production, as well as offering something for young people, uh, from benefits to financial support for participating in your work. It's important to create a reciprocal and non extractive relationship with young people working in the climate and environmental movement, because we often experience burnout, burnout and tokenism, and that can really, 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 really make it hard for us to maintain our energy in this movement. Last but not least, I would like to say thank you very much for having me here, and it was a pleasure speaking in this symposium. And if you want to reach out, particularly to know more about young people living on work on food systems and climate change on the ground, or if you want to, if you are a young person and you want to be able to be involved in like food systems and agri-food systems around climate biodiversity issues, please do reach out to me and reach out to Youth for Nature to know more and to get engaged. And I can also point you to other networks and organizations within your country, within your community, or at the international level which you can get involved in. Hi, my name is Mafalda Gonçalves. My name is Pedro Gonçalves. We are 18 years old. And we're from Lisbon, Portugal. We are part of the Co-Create project, more specifically the task force. There's a group designed to create a declaration to fight against child obesity. This group is formed by members of all the different countries that participate in the Co-Create project, such as Portugal, Poland, Norway and the Netherlands. We are scouts from Portugal, Lisbon, and uh, at first CoCreate asked us to be part of one of the alliances. We were in that project with some of other scouts from our group and from other groups. And, uh, and then further on uh, we decided it would be fun to uh, participate in the task force, so here we are. <laughs> Everything started in the alliances that every country that participates in the Co-Create project has. Uh, every country had at least one alliance and uh, we worked in order to create policy ideas uh, that we could um, use and adopt in our communities, in our local communities. Exactly, so we took those propositions and we started to create a declaration based on those ideas. So our, uh, our declaration, the result of it, uh, is a work uh, made by uh, teams from all of Europe. I think that this project is really important for me to participate in because I feel that uh, as a young member of this society I should have a voice and I should try to uh, change the things that are uh, bad for uh, my generation. For instance, child obesity that is becoming a problem more common and more present uh, in our daily basis. So I think that my leadership is important because as a young member of the society uh, I know my generation and I know the problems that we face uh, every day on our daily basis and uh, I can can give them a voice and try to solve them. And leadership is really important because we have a clear mindset of our necessities and uh, we need to have a voice when it comes to leading our communities. We've, we have adopted our declaration two weeks ago. Um, we have now just started to see some results coming out of our declaration. We have been invited to several events to present our declaration. Uh, these events are uh, made to promote uh, youth engagement on this type of projects. So uh, we are starting, as Pedro already said, we are starting to see the results from our declaration. I think that the main lesson learned uh, with this project is that when we put our minds and our hearts into something that we like and that we think it can change the world for, for the better. The uh, biggest lessons that co-create uh, taught us is that uh, we need to believe in what we're doing so we can really make a difference and so we can write uh, a good declaration and uh, we can uh, and we can be trusted. I think that we can engage young people by showing them that when they participate in this kind of projects that they really uh, create a better society and a better world. They, are, they aren't uh, just words that we put into a paper. We, we actually uh, do something with them and give uh, our generation a voice. Yeah. We need to be more active and we need to grab these opportunities to uh, empower our generation and talk in be on behalf of our generation. Thank you for listening to us and to uh, give a platform to talk about our declaration and uh, youth engagement. Please check out our declaration. I think uh, you'll find it very interesting. Hi everyone, I am Liana. Thank you for uh, letting me speak here and thank you for listening. Welcome in my living room in Utrecht, a city in the middle of the Netherlands. Uh, here we work from home uh, because of COVID-19. I think you have uh, similar problems over there. 
that welcome in my uh, house. Um, I am the director of Slow Food Youth Network in the Netherlands, uh, a network of more than 600 young people between the age of 18 and 32 who want to know more about food, the food system and want to change something within their own power. As the director of that network, I try to give those young people a stage, a network and a voice. The network, network started as a movement 11 years ago. A handful of young people saw that the system needed a change and they got involved with Slow Food an international organization which works together with hundreds of thousands of people worldwide to get good, clean and fair food available for everyone. With their support, they started Slow Food Youth Network in the Netherlands. The founders of Slow Food Youth Network saw that not only farmers and consumers were miles apart, it was also the case for people within the food system. Chefs did not talk to farmers, policymakers did not talk with producers, etc., etc. People who work with the same products and within the same system did not work together. They didn't even know each other. But if we want to change a system, shouldn't we do it together? We believe so. That's why we started to bring all those young people who work within the same system together. Farmers, chefs, policymakers, producers, marketeers, scientists, food technologists. We brought them together 11 years ago and we still do. How do we do that? We do that with events and eating, but we also do it with a curriculum. We call it the Slow Food Youth Network Academy. Every year we bring together 26 young people who are active within the food system. We let them speak to one another about what they do and what, challenging, what challenge, challenges them. Next to that we show them that they are a part of the food system and how the food system looks like with excursions, workshops and lectures. And they also work together on problems or issues. Because we believe that doing actual stuff together results in sustainable cooperation. The most important outcome of that academy is that the participants learned about the food system, they are able to form their own opinion and they have the tools and network to change something within their own power, alone, but mostly together. I personally think that the feeling of not being alone, the feeling being surrounded by people who also want a better and fairer food system, is so important to give young people the courage to actually stand up and do something. We teach young people that it's okay not to always have the same opinion, to have doubts and to know it all, to not know it all. That's okay and you are not less worthy because you think differently or don't know. This feeling, this knowledge that they are there are several roads towards a good, clean and fair food system and that's okay and that you can choose your own path is something we need and I think that our network is providing that. In that way we support them to be a leader. That leadership is important because if we don't speak up or if we don't show others that things can go differently and better, no one will see. Young people have such great ideas and they are not stuck in the current system. They are young, flexible, they have less responsibilities, which make them more free and therefore more creative and innovative. innovative. Young people can imagine another world, which is harder when you get older. We need big dreamers and that's why we need young leaders. How did I get involved? I'm born and raised in a small farmer village and the sense of community I got on my family's farm and the agricultural community around that farm is something that I cherish forever and has truly shaped me into who I am now. However, I see that this community is fading because the farmers cannot live anymore growing food. Rich people from cities have the money to buy those farms, not to farm there, but to live there. So a lot of farms disappear and with that, the community. At the same point, I see young people who want to farm sustainable, but cannot get the money. And I also see that consumers need more farms to visit, more places in which they can involve with food productions. They need more farms. It is so painful and the feeling our landscape, it is so painful and the feeling that our landscape formed by food productions will only be the decor of the rich is something which hurts me and why I got interested in agriculture and food. And that's why I joined Slow Food Youth Network as a volunteer. To tell people about the problems in the food system and to work together towards a better food system. Now, after several years as a volunteer, I am the director and I'm very happy I can do this work. 
Um, and I think a lot of young people recognize the feeling that they want to share or say something which they cherish. It doesn't have to be the community I uh, cherish or uh, saw or learned, so, gave me so much. But it can also be biodiversity, environment, food culture. I think that it's a drive for young people to save and build something for next generations. Although the Slow Food Youth Network does great things in the Netherlands, we of course face challenges. We see that a lot of social classes and food cultures are not re representative in our network and in the national food movement. That is something we really want to change. We need everyone to change the system. Next to that, it is a challenge to get money to do all this. We want to put our time in chasing the food system and involving youth, but a lot of times we are busy with, with a financial situation. It's hard to get enough money to do what we do. That is, of course, a challenge a lot of organizations face. And um, yeah, I think we have to work together more to, yeah, to face that. Finally, what I would like to advise on how to engage young people for the food system change is to let them dream big. Don't push them down because they are too, too idealistic or the dreams are too big. Use those dreams, use those, this energy, give them a voice and provide them with the tools and the network to make a change. Thank you for listening. Please look me up on social media if you want to follow what we do and good luck with changing the food system. Bye.